my name is Hannah Mathis, and I'm the president of REPAIR, which stands for Restoring, Educating, and Preparing Southwest Florida. Our leadership class put together an initiative to create a Zoom forum where we interviewed multiple people that have experience in affordability and sustainability after natural disasters such as Hurricane Ian. Take a look. Hello. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Kelly. My name is Rebecca Smith. And before I introduce you to your two interviewers, I would like to tell you a bit more about Repair. Okay. Our mission is to restore, educate, and prepare Southwest Florida communities before and after natural disasters to create sustainable, well-connected neighborhoods. Now let me introduce you to your two interviewers, Julia Dodge and Lauren Major. Hi, um, so we wanted to start out and see if you would just kind of give us some examples from your reporting and your experience on the difficulties and types of things that people are facing in Southwest Florida in regards to housing. Okay, well, I can um, actually speak from personal experience. Um, I spent 10 years living over in Southwest Florida in the early 90s, um, and that's where I started my career, and um, at the time, yeah, I was paying $600 to live on Sandoval Island. Um, I had friends that were also journalists that were paying a little bit more, you know, around the 600 figure, but, you know, even in Fort Myers at, at housing complexes. Um, and, you know, we weren't, we, we didn't make very much money, um, but it was still relatively affordable. Um, certainly, you know, it's nowhere like it is now. Um, you know, we could, we could work there. Sandoval also had housing that a lot of journalists lived in. Um, they built workforce housing to try and, you know, to try and keep police officers and teachers um, to live on the island. And, um, but it turned out that they actually made a little bit too much more money. And so it was largely journalists um, and service workers. And um, so also um, when I got the job here right before the hurricane, um, you know, I was looking at my options. I'm a homeowner on the East coast of Florida and I was looking at my options and just blown away. I mean, even though I know Southwest Florida because my parents retired there and it was kind of a home away from home for 18 years, just the, the rent, just, I had never really looked at the rent in for decades, you know, since I had left. Um, and I was just blown away at how much money that places were costing. Um, still to this day, um, you know, I frequently, I'm, I'm renting a room from a colleague, but I frequently go on to um, Craigslist and Airbnb to get an idea of what, of what you know, my options are. Um, and there, I kid you not, there is a couch that someone will let you sleep on for $67 a night. There's two couches in a room, so I guess that house would fetch um, over $150, $170 um, for a night. If you have two people renting a couch, these aren't uh, full out couches either. It's just, it's insane what's going on. Um, it's happening all over Florida. It's it's not just Southwest Florida. Um, so, and you know, from my reporting, um, I have seen just absolutely awful housing in Immokalee that landlords have the nerve um, the uncommon decency to try and get a hundred dollars, you know, per week per per renter um, to live in absolute squalor where there's holes in the ceilings and windows that don't shut and animals come up through the floors, mold everywhere. I mean, these places are fetching over, you know, two thousand dollars a month because they cram so many people into them. Um, you know, I've been writing a lot about a um, RV park in Bonita Springs that um, after the hurricane, uh, this place was not damaged, but after the hurricane, a new owner came in and took over. And, and you know, these were working class people or retirees, a lot of people on fixed incomes. And this new guy came in and, and you know, had grand dreams of, you know, you know, initially before the hurricane had thought, you know, I'll turn this into a really upscale, try and compete with Naples, you know, top of the line RV park, where some of those places, you know, they, to have a plot there, it's $200,000 just to have a concrete pad. And this guy, you know, I had thought maybe he would do that. But then with the hurricane, he realized that he could make a lot of money off of you and I, or taxpayers, um, by having FEMA trailers or the state trailers come in there. And so he displaced 
hundreds of people um, that had been paying rent, you know, very little compared to Southwest Florida to, to live there and their mobile homes, these old mobile homes and manufactured homes. And he's kicked them out, all the renters, so that he can have Governor DeSantis's trailers come in there. And that's what this place is filled with now, aside from a few homeowners. Um, so it's, you know, there, there's a crisis here. There was a crisis before Ian and Ian only exasperated it. All right, thank you. I was wondering what factors affected affordability and which that you've seen have had the most significant impact on affordability. You know, there's there's a lot of factors. Um, I, I think probably the number one that is is Florida wages, which are just abhorrent. They're awful. Um, you know, it's if, if the rest of the country paid employees like they do in Florida, then Florida wouldn't be a vacation land because no one could afford to come down here and, and vacation. Um, it wouldn't be a retirement home because a uh, place for retirees because no one would have any money in their savings account to, you know, buy that home in Florida. It's, it's, that's the first part um, is, is, you know, the, there's this notion that you're getting paid in sunshine. And I know people that actually, when they've had job offers have been told that, um, you know, oh, well, you know, it's sunny here and, you know, you can wear shorts all year and you get paid in sunshine and, and they make these excuses for having just unrealistic, um, ideas about what is what people can live on so that that's the that's the first thing um you know th and then what's going on with that is you know we have florida is just people do want to live here um you know because of the sunshine and because you know there isn't a state income tax and all that but a lot of people you know realize that when they get here that there's just a number of you know like working class people like myself realize that there's just a number of of option or just a, there's if you're not wealthy you're going to struggle if you're you know if if you don't have if if you still are working you you are going to struggle because the cost of housing you know to buy a home is is I've seen studies that it's double what it should be in the Fort Myers metropolitan area. Um, you know, other places are saying that, you know, I, I saw something that, you know, if you've got average houses going for $400,000, you know, when you've got average workers making 43,000 or even less, um, how are you going to, how are you going to be able to afford anything like that? And then, you know, another matter that's going to affect affordability is, you know, people come in and buy these homes and think that they'll want to do a rental unit and but then suddenly you're paying three times more than anyone in the country for insurance to insure your home so you know that's another thousand dollars a month that you're putting into escrow to pay your insurance bill at least um then you've got interest rates you know as we're trying to cool the economy down that's going to be another thousand dollars and so you know, if, if you're looking, as I'm sure you guys do, you know, if you're looking to rent something and you think, my God, the greed, I can't believe that someone wants three thousand dollars for this for this house. And but then if you step back and realize, well, you know, what did they pay for it? You know, did they probably paid two hundred thousand dollars more than they should be paying it because it's a it's Florida, you know, and what is their interest rates and what you know, the, a lot of this goes into how people, you know, when people do you know, buy something as a, as a rental income. And yet, sure, people want to make money, but there's a lot that goes into that decision as to what, as to what they're going to charge, as well as when there's a shortage, then the demand goes up and um, the prices go up to meet because people are willing to pay those prices. So you've got that. Um, and then Airbnb and, and BRBO, this influx of short-term rentals certainly did a number on, um, on affordability because people um, realize that I can make some money, um, ex you know, especially after COVID when people weren't traveling and, you know, hotel prices, as soon as things started opening up, hotel prices doubled. Um, and so Airbnb became this, this second choice for people and everyone wanted to travel and come to Florida and get away from whatever, you know, town that they're in lockdown. And, so that was raising the rates, you know, considerably. 
Um, and then people are realizing that they can actually do a hell of a lot better than with a long-term renter. Um, if people still want to come to Florida and are willing to pay, you know, $100, $200 a night um, to stay in someone's, you know, cottage or stay in their extra bedroom or whatever that might be, um, you know, so that, that affects affordability. And then the another major thing is just the an unresponsive government you know, um, that gets caught up in what's called nimbyism, which is not in my backyard. Um, you know, affordable housing is is not Section 8 housing and it's not public housing. It's workforce housing. It's it's what governments need to be able to provide to say that they are doing everything they can to to provide for the, you know, the citizenry. And um, but governments just really are reluctant because so many people are breathing down their neck saying, I don't want this. I don't want those people near me. And it's, you know, it's really short-sighted. So there's, there is no one factor. I, I think it's just, it's in everything. So after kind of presenting different factors that affect affordability and talking about the different difficulties people are facing, what do you feel are the best practices for citizens of Southwest Florida to become more educated on these different matters regarding housing? Well, I think, um, I think that the education is going to become, is, is coming from just seeing it for yourself. I mean, when you guys finish up your your education i don't know you know if, if you plan on sticking around or you know i'm sure you're even looking for housing you know at each year um you know so you're seeing it firsthand and I, I think the best you know to become more educated on this is to you know to get involved to pay attention to what your government is not doing and what they're required to do um or keep pestering journalists like myself and we'll do that for you you know um you know, there's there's the Florida Housing Coalition. There's local coalitions that, um, you know, I guess just getting yourself familiar with, you know, um, with with the laws. I mean, it's it, it's a legal obligation of governments to be able to provide affordable housing. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, including myself, um, until more recently. Um, you know, I, we all know that, you know, there's, you know, public housing and, and things like that, but it's also, there, there's a legal responsibility to try and, to try and provide housing and through, you know, various task forces and initiatives throughout all local governments and state governments. And so, you know, just to get familiar with that and to get familiar with, you know, what your local county commission, your city commissioners are doing. Um, and if, if you think that things aren't, right then you know speak up you know that governments can't necessarily dictate you know um com you know completely what what private entities are going to do and and um although some some governments will say you know they'll they'll put a moratorium saying you cannot raise rents more than this and they they get a lot of pushback and um but you know it's it's what the the public wants in terms of you know I mean, I know someone who was paying two thousand dollars to rent, and overnight, I think it went up to twenty six hundred dollars um, after her first year. And you know, it's just and so some some governments will say, you know, we can't have this, and they will try and 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 you know stop that um, by saying, you know, no, you must give, you can't go up more than ten percent without you know a certain amount of time notice. And you know, the law does afford some things um in terms of notice but um um you know it's just uh, become an informed citizen and you certainly will become that way when when you start thinking about your future and where you want to live and can you afford to live at, at whatever salary you know is being offered to you for your careers all right besides education what are the current goals of southwest florida to combat the issues of housing affordability and the overdevelopment of communities that are unaffordable for the working class that you have seen? And how do you see citizens being involved in these efforts? Well, I mean, you know, 
there are goals that, you know, these local local municipalities certainly have goals because they have to. Um, it's just a matter of they just they keep getting combated by this nimbyism where people are just saying, no, I don't want this. I don't want this in my backyard. I just want gated communities with golf courses and country clubs. And, you know, um, you know, there are there are there are certainly goals. Everyone has. I mean, just just a few days ago in Fort Myers, the Diocese of Venice, the Catholic Church, um, a big group, um, you know, came together for kind of a, a groundbreaking, although they had already broken the ground previously. Um, but they came together with this private company that's based in Fort Myers um, that specializes in affordable housing. And they announced that after seven years that they were finally, you know, pouring the concrete. And it took seven years to get to this place in not the most desirable part of Fort Myers, but, it ha but an area where there is certainly need. The diocese owned the land. And so... Um, you know, they were doing the good work that that of their what, you know, their religion tells them to do to care for people and to provide. And um, they teamed up. And, but it took seven years to get through these hoops with with governments, um, as well as the hurricane didn't help. And then the building supply of is also not really helping. But when they announced it, they had talked about rent being on the low end of three hundred dollars um to i want to say eight hundred dollars and it would be based on what your income is and um but now just a few years later and it, not when they announced it, it was that low but just a few in 2019 and um and so just the other day when they were you know saying hey we're breaking ground the prices are now at the six hundred dollar level and that's partly because they're not doing one bedroom homes anymore but you know these prices are based on what's called the area medium income which is about eighty thousand dollars and and for since i'm not a math major let's just say it was a hundred thousand if it's you know the idea of affordable housing is you're not paying more than 30 percent of your income to for housing and so if, if the area medium income is a hundred thousand then that would be um you know you making thirty thousand dollars a year in terms of what you could afford um and um and so the rent is kind of based on what if someone making thirty thousand dollars can afford, and so then they set those those um, those prices by that. But the problem is, is you don't have a lot of people keeping those people in mind. Uh, the floor, the state of Florida just pumped three hundred million more dollars into this initiative. It's about seven hundred million. And, um, you know, the governor was touting this as like the biggest thing that Florida's ever done. And I, I do believe that it is. However, this is for people on the higher end, primarily. Um, you know, it's people that make 120% over the area median income, which would be $120,000. And to like $80,000 and not really the, the, the working stiffs, the $30,000 a year, the janitors, uh, the minimum wage workers. And, you know, th there are things that may help the lower end, but, you know, a lot of the initiatives that you see is more for the upper manager, you know, the, um, you know, the, the police officer, um, even, you know, because it's, we're not, what's what a lot of governments are doing is they're helping a higher echelon than the than the servers um and you know there's Amakli is now raising their own money privately they can't ask for any they're not asking for any state or federal funding um this housing initiative because they also want to help people that are undocumented they don't care if you're documented or not and um you know they just recently broke ground and they They've been working for years and years and years to get, I think they've got like $6 million. And they, it took Jimmy or Warren Buffett's son to be able to get that rolling with a million dollar pledge. And so they're still raising money and they're, you know, trying to get people out of these awful, awful living conditions in Immokalee. And so, you know, you've got that, you know, initiatives by people like them and Sarasota's, you know, came up with this, you know, private and public partnership, um, you know, where they're actually doing mixed income. You know, you've got some people that do have housing vouchers and then you've got, you know, other people that they are, these rents are based on 
what this person is is making. Um, and so, you know, there there are places trying and they have been trying. It's just a matter of it takes a long time and it's kind of a survival of the fittest. People just have to keep fighting for to do the decent thing. So. So if the current state of housing affordability continues the way it has been, how will the community of Southwest Florida be impacted as working class people and families continue to be pushed out of the area? Oh, so if this if this continues, um, I, I'd say, you know, next time you go to a restaurant, look around. I mean, right now, actually, you know, if, if, if any of you take your car in for an oil change or, you know, go to restaurants and, you know, you see all of these help wanted signs. I mean, it's not just that people don't want to work. It's that they can't afford to live there. It, it's you're not going to have people taking care of you. You're not going to have your your nurses. You're not going to have your teachers, your police officers. I mean, there already is a shortage in in uh, southwest Florida and all over Florida. I was writing about it, um, the lack of workers that there's not enough people answering the 911 emergency calls over in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale. And I exposed, you know, how that was, you know, how that was detrimental and people were dying because of that. You know, if 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 Florida doesn't put the brakes on 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 what's going on in, in some way and, and really start speeding it up, you know, building houses and um then you're not going to have people taking care of you. You're, you know, what people are used to on a daily basis that, that people just aren't here. You know, in Collier, I was reading a study that like 61% of the um, of the jobs pay less than $33,000 a year. So where are these people going to live? Back when I first started my career over in Southwest Florida, everyone lived in Bonita Springs or Estero. Well, the school's now in Estero. Look around you. It's it's all gated communities. The, the you know, look at Fort Myers Beach if you ever spent any time there. Where are these people going to go? Where are the workers? They used to be able to live there. Um, they're not going to be able to now. You know, Southwest Florida is, is going to change drastically. Um, this hurricane is 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 just speeding it up. And and I'm not alone in my thoughts on that. It's It's going to change drastically. And I just... I don't know. I, they're going to have to continue to bus in people just like they used to do, or they probably still did on the islands. Some of the workers to work at hotels, um, you know, and there's just there's a shortage of about a million houses in Florida right now that I can see from from studies that I have seen. And, you know, I was just the other day in preparation for this looking on Zillow and in the, the greater region, like even up to Okeechobee from here. And I think I found three places that were under a thousand dollars and it's clearly farm worker housing over around Okeechobee. There's just, there's nothing out there. And in, in spite of Florida growing and growing and building all sorts of apartments, it's, it's, they're losing the apartments that are under a thousand dollars. And are there any resources in place that are able to help people who have been displaced due to natural disasters? If so, if so what are they? And how can citizens of Southwest Florida get involved in these organizations in their efforts? There's there's lots of charitable organizations um, that you know help people with rent, um, but it's generally for one month. Um, you know, these well-endowed, you know, organizations, there's so much need that most places can't help you more than one month, pay your utility bill, pay, you know, it's for typically for people in crisis, but with natural disasters, um, you know, local governments can have been given money to try and help people make their um, insurance deductible, but, and it's not for everyone. I mean, you have to be, you know, you can't have a home that's over four hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, say to make your deductible. And some of these deductibles are, you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars for your insurance. And so, um, and you have to pay that out of pocket before you can try and get any insurance, um, you know, money back for your losses. So there are some local governments that do that, but mostly people are, you know, depending on federal emergency management agency, which you know 
there's a misnomer that they come in and really save the day. They they can only give so much money, like twenty thousand dollars. The small business administration loans can, you know, give out a few thousand dollars to, you know, maybe for a business a hundred thousand, but maybe ten thousand for for people. There's just there's there's really not a lot out there. And I think that people are realizing that. Um, you know, it's a big problem in Florida is is people not being insured or underinsured because insurance is so insane. It's like, and I know this from personal experience. Um, it's, it's insane. And it's my, everyone's is going to go up even higher because of Ian. And then with the flooding that's going on right now in Fort Lauderdale, I mean, this, it's people can't keep up with it. And so, you know, you're only going to get a payout of insurance as to what you actually paid into it in terms of, you know, I want my home, I have a $400,000 home and I'm going to, I want insurance. I'll pay for insurance that will cover the losses on this $400,000 home. A lot of people had, were underinsured and like, no, I can't afford that. Well, we got to go lower. We got to go lower. And so their payouts are only going to be much smaller. That's even if they get payouts, it's, it's such a battle to even try and get money from insurance um, after a natural disaster that, again, it's the survival of the fittest. You know, the state legislature met a couple of times to try and address this issue. And, and some will argue that they actually made it less friendly to the everyday homeowner because they took away their rights to some of their rights to try and sue to for to get your money. So it's just, you know, it's there really aren't that many resources. Um, you know, like Red Cross, you know, can, oh, you know, oh, here's some money to get a hotel for a couple of days, whatever disaster, fire, things like that. But people are, you know, you just got to hope that you have some money and a, a lot of friends and family um, in, in times of disaster, because there, there's really not a lot out there that I am. And I would like to be wrong with that, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. So those are actually all the questions that we had for you. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us and providing some insight. Okay, yeah. we need any clarification or anything? Um, I don't think so. Thank you for answering our questions. Okay, I hope that you have good panels and all that. I'm not sure if you're asking everyone the same questions, but I hope that this is providing you with some insight and maybe not scaring you too much for Southwest Florida, but it's, it's tough here.